All right, so we're going to start off the afternoon talking about one of uh, my favorite subjects, Linux monitoring. And so I give you Mr. Brian Treckle and Brandon Larson. Hello, can y'all hear me? Good afternoon, good afternoon. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I want to thank Doug and Phil for allowing me to talk. They did give me a time frame. I have a, a tendency of, uh, of going a little over time. All my students that were in my class, they know that. I, I don't believe in breaks. We'll just do eight hours straight, but they, don't, they didn't like that. So um, I'm super excited about being here again. My name is um, Bryant Treckle. I work at Security Onion. I've been here for almost three years in October. Um, I am a transplant from, uh, of Georgia. I'm originally from Western New York, um, so I'm excited to be down here. I, uh, I joined the Army back in 1999 uh, when they used to have these things called floppy disks and uh, cool things like that. Uh, but the recruiter called me and was like, hey, uh, do you want to join the Army? And I grew up in a super small town with like one red light and a bunch of grape farms, and I was like, yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. Do you have anything computer related? Uh, and my recruiter actually hooked me up. And so I spent 20 years in the Army um, just doing different types of network things. Uh, I got an opportunity to work at the White House. I did that for right about six years. And then after that, I became uh, what they call a warrant officer. So if you're unfamiliar with the Army term, that's like a subject matter expert on a particular field. Um, so I did that for like the last six years of my career. And that's where I met this guy, my partner in crime. Uh, we went around on DOD networks and uh, rake, rake some havoc um, trying to find evil. And so this is Brandon, uh, Brandon Larson. Uh, he's, again, he's my partner in crime. <laughs> so um, that's really um, about us. And what I wanted to do, you know, I was told once that if you ever want to be good at something, uh, just sign up to present that topic and you'll become really efficient. And so one of the things that I wanted to really focus on is how do I, uh, as an analyst, um, find evil in Linux? Right? I've been doing Linux administration for a long time. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty good with, with doing Linux things, but I've never really sat down and said, how do I find evil? How do I find evil inside of Linux? And so um, there's a couple of tools that we're going to talk about. Um, and then I want to show you how to use Security Onion to kind of sift through that data. And so without further ado, no presentation would be, would be complete without some dad jokes. So I'm going to go ahead and load some dad jokes. So the first one is, what did the buffalo yell to his son when he left for college? Bye, son, right? So my son, my oldest, is a, is a senior in high school, and I told him this, and he gave me, like, Dad, you're dumb look, so I know it's a good joke, right? That's the measure, all right? The second one is, uh oh where do dads keep their jokes? In a database, in a database, right? So, um, so those are your dad jokes. Um, I'm super excited about this again, uh, about presenting. So let's go ahead and get into the why. So why do I need to monitor my Linux systems? Why, right? And so there's this perceived wisdom out there that Linux-based operating systems are just more secure. Like, I don't need to monitor Linux because it's more secure than Windows, right? Windows are, or viruses are only a Windows thing, so as long as I'm smart with what I do, um, I'm going to be okay, right? And that has some truth to it, um, but I want to bank all of my, uh, put all my eggs in that basket um, because as Linux becomes more and more used as a platform to host our critical services, adversaries are digging more and more in to how they can exploit those. So we need to just stop making the assumption that uh, Linux is secure and we really need to start monitoring it. So um, the reason, a couple of things of why it's important to monitor our Linux is first off is the Linux-based malware is on a rise. Now I got this graph from uh, Atlas VPN and one of the services they have, if you subscribe to it, is they will look at all of your traffic <laughs> as it's passing through their VPN service and they will block malware that they know about. And so as you can see here from uh, third quarter of 2021 to fourth quarter of 2021, there was a 600% spike in Linux-based malware. Uh, passing through their VPN service. And so uh, uh, viruses and malware are no longer just a Windows thing. We can't just bank on that, right? So that's one thing um, why we need to monitor our Linux servers. Another reason is that we can't just blindly trust people's intent. Now, I am um, usually fall victim to clickbait if they do a good job with, uh, with the title. And so about a year ago, I saw this pop up and it said, how a university got itself banned from the Linux kernel. And I was like, what? Right, so I went ahead and clicked on it. Um, and apparently, if, who here is uh, familiar with this scenario? Anybody? 
couple of you? Yeah, so what was happening is, uh, as part of research, academic research, uh, what this professor was doing was he was submitting arbitrary code to the Linux kernel to try, he would, he would address an issue, but then contribute arbitrary code just to prove a point that he could actually do it for his research paper. And his actions actually got the university, like every, uh, get re or every request from that university banned from any commits. And so, um, you know, the, the, the reason why he was doing it was kind of suspect, but uh, in his research, he said one thing that he's seen, this is pretty interesting, is that bug hunters, this is cool, will fix bugs, well, will get paid, but then they'll introduce other bugs in their fix, right? So they could basically keep this thing going and keep on getting paid. So I thought it was pretty interesting uh, to t kind of take a look at that. So um, we can't blindly trust people's intent. And so um, the question is, how do I actually detect, right? How do I find this evil activity on my Linux systems? And so uh, what uh, Brandon and I did is we went ahead and grabbed our Linux system and I wanted to test three different tools. I wanted to test Sysmon for Linux, um, I wanted to test Audit Beats, and I also wanted to test Audit D. Now there's lots of different ways of analyzing Linux machines, but these are the ones that we chose. And so um, we went ahead and spun up lots of different machines uh, and we uh, created some, some data and we sent that data to Security Onion. And the two things I wanted to identify was, can I actually find evil activity and can I build detections on it? So can I find evil activity and can I build detections? And so that was kind of our mission, test out these three different types of uh, Linux monitoring applications and then see if I could find malicious activity uh, inside of Security Onion. So um, for our t attack scenario, um, what, what we did is we went to the internet and we kind of did some research and figured out, you know, what are some different types of attacks that have been out there? What are some detections that are out there? Um, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to create an attack scenario that I myself would overlook, right? That I myself would overlook. So, you know, some of the, some of the things like downloading files from the internet, uh, curl is a pretty common one, wget. If I saw that, I would automatically be like, huh? Right? And so I was like, how can I build an attack that like, I would miss? And so um, this is kind of be our attack scenario that we're going to use. Uh, up here for our initial access, uh, we're going to have malicious code downloaded. And it's going to be uh, downloaded uh, through G uh, GDP, which is GNOME debugger, GNU debugger. Um, and then we're going to have some discovery commands. Uh, so who am I, the SS command, uh, PS, and IPA uh, for IP address information. Uh, we're going to gather some credentials using a tool called Mimi Penguins, which is very similar to Mimi Cats. Uh, after that, we're going to go ahead and establish some persistence. Uh, and what I decided to do for persistence is uh, I wanted to write to the cron tab, but again, that's pretty common. So I just created a service. I figured if it's running as a service, it must be legit. Uh, and then finally, for data exfil, um, you know, I could use, again, some really common tools. But I was like, why don't I just SCP the data out of my network? Right? So this is kind of the attack. Um, scenario that we used for each of our different detections, okay, for each of the different detections. So what I want to do is kind of talk real quick about our lab setup. Uh, we have um, our C2 server that I used was called Sliver. Sliver is a free open source project. It's super cool. It's very similar to Meterpreter, um, but it gives you a little bit more capability. So I think it's a gap between Meterpreter and Cobalt Strike. It's free. It's pretty awesome. Um, and uh, so I have my red team activity. For my victim, I have just a generic uh, Ubuntu 20.04 uh, server, right? Uh, after that, and I have, again, we have Sysmon for Linux, FileBee, and I had OS Query installed. And then for the blue team, we had Security Onion uh, 23160 installed. Uh, we have some custom elastic ingest pipelines. So one of the things we wanted to do is as we ingest this data, we wanted to normalize it. Now, all of the ingest pipelines that we used are all on our GitHub, which you'll see at the end. So if you want to incorporate something like, incorporate something like AuditBeat or Sysmon for Linux, uh, we've already done all the back-end work to make it compatible with 23160. Um, and then I also wanted to uh, find ways of doing detection. So here you can see I have uh, Linux playbook plays. Uh, Sigma HQ actually has um, Windows-based plays and Linux-based plays. And so we just went ahead and incorporated all of their Linux plays. Um, and we use that as kind of our blue team um, detection mechanism. All right, so that's our lab setup. Any questions so far before I get into the, the live demo? Any questions? All right, 
So uh, I was told that you're supposed to rub a bald head for luck. So <laughs> go, go ahead and do this. Let's see if this demo actually works. Um, so again, what, we've, what I've done is earlier this morning, I went ahead and need to show my screen. Give me a second. Display settings. Good. All right. So, um, so what I did was earlier today, I went ahead and I replayed that, that attack scenario. And um, I am capturing both network data and I'm in this lab, I'm just using Sysmon for Linux. Or I'm just using Sysmon for Linux. So um, I've, I ran through that attack scenario, I've captured the network data, and I have uh, ingested my host data. So let me go ahead and zoom in here. Now, um, any good investigation should really start at your alerts interface. So if I go to my alerts interface, you see, I do have a couple of IDS alerts that triggered. A um, couple of things that may catch your, catch your attention is we have this ELF file being downloaded, and we also have this Python URIB suspicious user agent um, being downloaded. So it looks like there is some, uh, you know, some type of ne network activity uh, that triggered an alert. Now, this is a pretty cool view. I call this view the how much coffee does Bryant need to drink today because it gives me a good idea of what's going on in my network, but it doesn't really give me a lot of context about who's doing what. Right, you see I have uh, six um, different alerts for ET policy um, for the GNU uh, Linux app user agent. Now that could be six different hosts triggering that alert once or one host triggering it six times. So what I wanna do is I wanna go ahead and change this view. So I'm gonna click on this group by and change it to um, the second drop down. I call it the five tuple view because it gives me all of my IP and port information. And so if I come here and take a look, you can see that my alerts, I have really two different sessions. I have um, this uh, session between uh, my victim, which is 75.135, and this uh, IP address 91.38. And then I have um, two connections um, here. This is actually the same session, because you can tell the ephemeral ports are the same. So I have two different IDS alerts triggering on the same uh, connection. Right, on the same connection. So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and take a look at this alert. So I'm going to go, uh, we'll look at the ELF file download. I'm going to left click on here, um, go to drill down. What that's going to do is give me the unaggregated view. And what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and jump right to the PCAP data. I want to see the context around this alert. So I'm going to left click on the rule name, click on action. I click on PCAP and that will give me, send me to the PCAP interface. And as you can see from up here, we have a Git request um, for this comfortable chowder, right? And the IP address is this dotted quad. Uh, but look at the port, the ephemeral ports, uh, or the port's 443, which is kind of interesting. So, uh, you know, if I see 443 traffic, I'm usually thinking uh, it's probably encrypted, right? If it's encrypted data, I wouldn't be able to see this, uh, this content, right? So it looks like um, we have a ELF file or a Linux executable file being downloaded by our client. Now, that in itself is not necessarily bad. So whenever I see a, a file being downloaded, I like to ask really three questions. Question number one is, is that file malicious? Question number two is what application actually is responsible for downloading that? And question number three is was that executable file actually launched on my network, right? If I download a bad file and antivirus picks it up and gets rid of it, it's not really a huge deal, right? I wanna make sure, uh, is it bad? Uh, what application downloaded it? And did it actually execute um, on my host? And so to answer the first question about whether or not the file's good or bad, um, you know, one way we can um, do that is through the use of the MD5 hash, right? So I can go to our trusty virus total, look up that hash and see if virus total has seen it. So I'm at my alerts interface, and what I need to do is I need to go ahead and get to my MD5 hash. Now, I could download the PCAP and I could carve out the executable file and I could generate the hash if I wanted to, but we know that Zeek is already carving out or generating the MD5 hash for all files that it sees in clear text, right? So it's already doing that for me. So all I need to do is figure out how in the world do I get from this view to my Zeek file log, right? So what you can do is we can left click on any of these fields and I click on actions and correlate. 
And what that's going to do is that's going to scan um, that log and it's going to send me to the hunt interface with the unique identifier of that log and the network community ID applied. Now, if you have not heard of a network community ID, it's a base 64 representation of the SHA-1 hash of the five tuple of a session. Right, so say that a bunch of times fast. Right, so what it basically does is it takes that source, IP, and port, and protocol, and it concatenates it together, takes a SHA-1 hash, and then it takes the base 64 representation, so it's a little bit smaller. So this is the representation of that session. And as you can see here, I have three different modules or applications that are that saw either the unique identifier or the network community ID. So you can see I have uh, two Sericata alerts, I have two Zeek alerts, and I have one Sysmon log. Now, what I want to do is I want to get to the Zeek file log. Now you can see here, the Zeek file log doesn't exist. The reason why it doesn't exist is the Zeek file log doesn't have any port information and therefore it cannot compute the network community ID. So what I need to do is I need to hunt on a Zeek log. I need, or I need to correlate on a Zeek log, I'm sorry. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna left click on the event.module for Zeek and click on include. That's just going to apply a filter up here at the top to show me only Zeek logs with that information. And then I'm gonna come down here, I'm gonna pick any of these logs, left click, click on action and correlate. Now you can see I have my, uh, my Zeek file log as well, right? So I can left click on my Zeek file log, click on include. As you can see here, your event table has updated to include some inf useful information. What I want to do is I want to look and see inside of the Zeek file log, uh, where is the MD5 hash so I can, hunt, so I can uh, compare it to virus total. So as I scroll down here, the first thing I want to do is take a look at the file bytes seen and the file bytes total to make sure those are the same. If those numbers are not the same, that means that Zeek did not see the entire file and therefore the MD5 hash of that that Zeek is generating is not correct. All right, so because they are the same, I could come down here to this uh, MD5 hash, and I can do left click, click on virus total. Brrr, no matches, it must be good, right? If it's not red, it's good, right? Um, so, you know, I get asked this sometimes, like, you know, how many, how many reds do you need before it's bad? Uh, if any show up, it's bad, right? Um, but if nothing shows up, it's not good. Right, the opposite of bad is not necessarily good. So um, it's telling me virus total has never seen this file ever. Right, it's never seen this file ever. So what I need to do is I need to go ahead and uh, get some more context. So I don't know if the file's the file's bad, but maybe I can see what application on my host is responsible for downloading it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my hunt interface, and I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the file data set. So now I have my, my Sysmon network connection, right? And so in Linux, um, whenever a, um, an application with Sysmon enabled, when an application goes out to the internet, um, the, our Sysmon for Linux is going to generate a network connection log. Now, one of the things that we've done is we've gone ahead and whitelisted um, what we call low bins or living off the land binaries. So I don't want a network connection log for every single time um, you know, Firefox goes to the internet. I don't want to see all of those connections. I only want to see connections that are um, maybe like secondary, secondary um, methods to go download data, right? We call them low bins, living off the lands binary. So uh, if I go over here and I take a look at my Sysmon network connection log, click on include, one of the things that it provides me is it provides me with my, keep on going, keep on going, past it my process executable. So it says that uh, GDB, my GNOME debugger, right, was responsible for generating this connection out. Now, I can say, well, what other things besides um, going out to the internet did uh, this process do? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna left click on the PID, and I'm gonna go ahead and click on only. And what that's gonna do is it's going to populate this, I have it going to a new, uh, dash, new tab. It's going to go ahead and put that PID up here in the, um, the query bar. And as you can see, I have some playbook plays we'll talk about later. Um, I have 22 file creates, two process create, and one network connection all associated with that PID. So what I want to do is figure out, well, why in the world did my, did my debugger go out to the Internet and request this file? Like, what caused it to do that? 
right? So what I need to focus on is the parent process or the parent PID. What application is causing this application to go out and download this file uh, from a dotted quad host with a weird port? Why is that activity actually happening? So I'm gonna go ahead and click on the process creation, click on include, and if I open this first log up, it come down here under the, the parent process executable, I can see that I have a bash terminal that, is, that sent this command, right, that ran this command to go out to the internet. And so you can see I have the, the GNU debugger and we're saying go ahead and execute this Python. I'm gonna import a couple modules. Um, and then what I wanna do is go ahead and download this file, right, from the internet. And I want you to write it as dot systemed, dot systemed. Can y'all see that good? I can zoom in a little bit. Uh, go ahead and save it as dot systemed. I figured I'd name it something kind of close to what it should look like. Um, so we have dot systemed. So if I want to see, well, what else besides, besides going out and telling uh, GDB to go download this file, what else did that bash terminal do? Right? I want to know that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to that parent PID and I'm going to go ahead and do left click and click on only. Again, that's going to send me to the hunt interface with that parent process ID applied. And if I come down here and take a look, you can see that I have a couple of things. I have a, let me make sure my timestamps are good. Um, I have the, my bend at bash um, hitting this install.sh script. Um, and then I have my uh, GDB um, being com going out to the internet. And then I see the chmod um, dot x of systemd. So that's just giving it ability to uh, execute a file. Now you're gonna say, how in the world did I get here? Right? And so one of the things I wanted for this scenario, um, and I know I'm probably not the only person who's done this before, but who here has ever um, you know, had a problem that you wanted to solve in, in, uh, in Linux and you Googled it, a GitHub repo came up and you just, down, you just cloned the GitHub repo and just did what it said, right? Go ahead and do this, do that, do this, do that, and it works, right? No one else does that but me, right? And so, by the way, when you want to install Sysmon for Linux, just go to my GitHub repo and just copy and paste everything in there. And so what, what, the, what the, uh, the sysadmin did was he just went to um, a program and did it. And if you look at the current working directory, you can see the current working directory is um, some cool script running in desktop. So um, it looks like Bash had launched uh, an executable file called install.sh inside of this directory on the, uh, on the, the, uh, the, the server, all right? So we have a bash terminal. Um, we have bash calling my, install the sh, then going out to the internet, uh, and then it's going ahead and give permissions. Now, from here, one of the challenges is um, I can't tell whether or not that system deed actually initiated from this process. So what I need to do is I will need to do one of two things. I can either um, query, this is cool, if you have OS query installed, you can query OS query and say, hey, I want you to look and see if there's a process that's running that has a certain MD5 hash, right? So you can say, is there a process running on this system that has this hash? And so, I have that query up here, up in OS query. It's really complex, so I'm not gonna to try to explain what it's doing. But essentially, we're joining a whole bunch of tables together, and I'm gonna put this on my GitHub, but if you drop the MD5 hash in that, where, where it says where h.md5 is, if you put your hash, OS query will search all of the running processes and see is there a process with this MD5 hash running. And so my third question was, you know, is this process, did it get executed? If the process is still running and I hit that with OS query, it'll tell me the PID uh, for that process. So it's a pretty awesome uh, way of doing it. Now, I'm not running it right now, so I'm not gonna run the query because it won't work. Um, but what I could do, if you didn't have OS query, is I could just go ahead and hunt for um, this system deed. Right, so I'm gonna go ahead and copy this. I'm gonna go up to my, my hunt query, and I'm gonna say um, process uh, executable. And I'm gonna go ahead and say asterisk system deed. 
and you can see that I have a Sysmon process creation for that log, which is telling me that um, Sysmon on Linux said, hey, I saw this process actually get executed. And as you can see here on our, uh, on our events table, we have the process command line, that's what's ran. We have the process PID, the actual PID of the process. Um, what executed it, in this case it's system, D, uh, and then the working directory. So if I want to see, well, what did system D do after, system to do after it got launched, I can left click on this PID, and click on uh, only. Again, it sends me to the hunt interface with that query. Now I can see I have um, system D spun up a bash terminal, another bash terminal. So if I want to see what this bash terminal did, I left click on this, click on only. And now I have a whole bunch of cool things that's happening. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of playbook. That's going to come later. Um, so if I come here and take a look, now I can see all the things that um, my malware actually did. Right? It ran this groups and this less pipe and bash. And all this stuff right here is, uh, gets generated as soon as you get a bash terminal. Those are all the things that happens. After it got a bash terminal, it ran who am I? Right? PS exec, IPA, the SS. That's the same thing as netstat. Right, but nest out's like a wrapper for it, so I just went right to the binary. Um, and then I see this right here. I see a uh, user bin Perl, uh, user bin LW downloads, right? And it looks like I have an IP address for um, 230 in this Mimi Penguins.sh. I'm saving this file to this dot Mimi Penguins.sh. So it looks like I it went to the internet and downloaded this file. Now, if I wanted to see this file, um, what I could do is I could go ahead and try to pivot to my network data, right? I should be able to pivot to my network data and see the network data associated with this connection, right? So in order for me to do that, what I need to do is I need to go to the PID for, for this, for this um, executable. I'm going to do left click and click on only. Again, that's going to send me to the interface with that PID applied. Now, if I come down here, you can see I have my Sysmon network connection. Now, the reason why this fired again is because this is one of those living off the land binaries that adversaries can use to download additional, con download additional payloads. So I'm going to go ahead and left click on network connection. And you can see I have my IP address information here. Now, if I want to get to my network data from my host data, what I need to do is I just need to correlate on a network connection log. So if I go ahead and click on this destination IP, click on actions and correlate, it's going to go ahead and send me uh, to the hot interface with my network community ID applied. And now you can see I have Zeek logs associated with that um, process that went up to the internet to download the file. So if I left click on, uh, we'll do HTTP, I should be able to come down here, open it up, and go to PCAP and view the uh, PCAP associated with that, um, that process. Right? So now you can see I have a GET request for mimipenguins.sh. And I have the user agent, and then I have the actual payload itself that was downloaded. All right, so now I can go through the actual file and say, well, what is mimipenguins.sh actually doing? Is this what I want um, to happen on my network? And so what Mimi Penguins does is, again, it's very much like Mimi Cats. It'll go ahead and dump a bunch of proc memory, and then it'll, it'll grep through it. It'll pull out any clear text passwords. All right, so it's going ahead and doing some credential gathering. Um, after that, we have... Um, our bash terminal, uh, you know, he, he's downloaded the file, he made it executable, he went ahead and executed the file. If I wanted to see everything on the host that Mimi Penguins actually did, if I left click on this PID and click on only, again, it'll send me to the hunt interface, and now I can see all the activity um, that the um, Mimi Penguins actually did. And if you take a look at the process creation, you can see it um, dumping all of the, the memory commands. So, dumping all the memory out. So, um, that's what the Mimi Penguins did. It dumped a bunch of memory. One thing that's kind of cool, if I go up here to the um, get rid of process creation, if I look at the file create, I click on include, and I focus on the, the target right here, you can see that um, the command actually, uh, you know, I did a pipe, so I ran Mimi Penguins, and then I piped it to a password.txt. So right here is telling me that my credentials, not only did he run it, but he took it and he wrote it to a file called passwords.txt. All right, so I was able to see that activity. Um, after that, we can see um, we have, uh, he copied his executable, this .system, to Etsy. 
then he went ahead and um, Vim or created a, a service file, so system system dot service, uh, and then he uh, enabled that service, and then he went ahead and added the user Trogdor uh, with the password of Trogdor. And one of the things you want to do is be able to like get root access, right? So I needed to add Trogdor to my sudoers group, and so what I what I did is like, well, I could just put a uh, a file, a hidden file dot accounts inside of the sudoers dot d directory, and just give it the ability to go to um, to go to root to go right to root, right? To have root access. Um, and then after he did that, he went ahead and exfilled the data. Now, um, one of the things I wanted to do was like, I love doing SCP because it just sits on Linux, right? And I can exfill data without doing anything. I don't have to FTP it, right? But the problem is, is that, you know, most enterprises are going to block port 22 going out of the network, right? So that, that's pretty common. So, all, so I was like, mm, how can I get by that? So what I did was just told my server to listen for SSH on port 443, and I told SCP just to send it out that port. All right, go ahead and send it out, port 443. And I'm pretty sure you're not blocking 443 leaving your network. Um, and go ahead and exfil that data out, right? And so if I wanted to see the network data associated with this, because it's a network connection log, I can left click on the PID over here. I can click on only. And it gets a little tricky in figuring out which one it, that I need to actually click on. It's going to be this one right here. There's lots of SCPs, just like a wrapper for a bunch of other stuff. Um, so if I go to this process right here and I click on only, I should see my network connection log. So where it gets good. If I left click on here and click on Actiones and Correlate, now I have my uh, Zeek connection log. I need to get to, I want to correlate on a Zeek log so I can get all the logs associated with this connection. So if I left click on the log, click on correlate. Now you can see I have my Zeek SSH log. If I left click on this and click on include, um, I have my actual SSH log itself. All right, so now I can go ahead and take a look at all of the cool things that Zeek carved out about that SSH connection. Right. So that's kind of a, one of the cool things of being able to uh, you know, fully integrate the, the host data and the network data, right? From an analyst, I could tell the whole story without actually leaving my terminal, right? I have to go to the host and try to figure stuff out. Um, so that's pretty cool, right? I, I, can, I can say with some confidence that some malicious activity actually happened on this host. But the one thing that I'm missing is all this activity is happening, and I've yet to see... Uh, any command and control network data, right? Obviously, he has some type of connection between my client and the C2 server. So what I want to do, is I want to see, can I find um, the network data associated with this connection? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the alerts interface, and I'm going to change it to my 5-tuple view, and I'm going to go ahead and left-click on the IP address here and click on um, hunt, actions hunt. That's going to send me to the hunt interface with the IP address applied. Um, I want to look at just the Zeek. I have a whole bunch of Zeek HTTP logs. I'll take a look at those. If I open it up, you can see I have a whole bunch of connections from my client um, to this external server on port 80, right? Whole bunch of different connections. And so what I could do is I could open each of these up. Right, or I can go to the PCAP, or I can display this data inside of dashboards. And I kind of like doing the dashboards a little bit better because there's like 500 of them, right? So maybe the dashboards will give me a little bit better view. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and go to dashboards, and I'm going to um, look at the HTTP dashboard, and I'm going to go ahead and dump this IP address in here. <clears throat> Right, so now I, I'm able to see um, all of the information uh, that happened on there. Now, because my boss is here, I got to make some colors for him. There you go, Doug. Did this for you, buddy. <laughs> right? I got to make some colors. But it allows you to dig through that data and see what's happening, right? What are the weird connections um, that you're seeing here? And so one of the things I want to show you with... Um, with Sliver, it's pretty cool. If I left click on here, click on actions and PCAP, you can see I have a whole bunch of cool information. You have a post request. Uh, my user agents, Mozilla, Firefox, why do onions make me cry? How did that get there? 
right? So the cool thing about Sliver is Sliver is completely customizable. And so, you know, one of the things we like to do is say, look at the user agents. You know, that's how you can tell if it's good or bad. Or I could just put a good one there, right? Um, and so Sliver is pretty cool. You see some base 64 encoded data here and hex, and hex data. So you think you can decode it? Well, Sliver is pretty cool in the fact that it, it encrypts all the data and then it encodes it on top of it. So if I go a ahead and send this to CyberChef, like, I think I'm going to just decode it. It's just going to be a bunch of shenanigans. Um, so go ahead, click on CyberChef. What type of encoding is this? Who wants to take a whack at it? Rhymes with Bex from Hex. Um, so if you look at here, it's, it's, it's already encoded. So they encode encrypted data. I don't know why, um, but that's a functionality you can have. And so... Um, that's really it for the kind of the, the live demo portion. I wanted to show you all, um, you know, kind of the ease that you can, uh, the ease that you can use to go find evil um, between network and host data on, on Linux hosts. Uh, one thing about Sliver is I've seen like Intel reports that have Sliver as a, a command and control infrastructure that adversaries are using. Right, so if, you, if you're in a, an organization where you do purple teaming, and you want to get some kind of like real life um, action and see like what's happening in real life and be able to control it, Sliver is a great uh, tool to use because it is being used out in the wild um, to actually compromise uh, hosts. Any questions about, um, about my demo? Got a little bit more slides. Up, up there. That's a loaded question. A Linux. <laughs> me and Windows have an, uh, we have an, uh, an arrangement. I don't like to use it, and it doesn't want me to. Um, uh, I'll tell you how much I, I love Linux. When I first be, I started doing cybersecurity, I know I, I needed to learn Linux, so I blew out every single Windows machine on my, on my house, which I thought was a good idea until I realized that my printer didn't have a print driver in Linux. And then I'm trying to figure out how to write a print driver. Um, so that was an adventure. Or I could buy a new printer, but that's the easy way. Um, but yeah, I would rather, I would much rather uh, um, do work on, on Linux machines. I will tell you though, um, Linux for Sysmon and Audit D, um, they're, and I think uh, Brandon will talk about this later, there's some things that are missing. So looking at just Sysmon for Windows, I can tell a lot more of a story than using some of the Linux tools. And so, um, you know, Depends on what you're looking at. I think Windows, uh, you can find a lot of stuff using Sysmon for, for Windows. Um, but I, I think I still do Linux. I'm a Linux. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's a great question. So. The, the question is, you know, why I, I hunted on it. So why would I hunt on a PID instead of on the name? So one of the things, that, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, if I had like 50 hosts, right, 50 Linux servers, and I focus on our executable file name, right, I could get a lot of other false positives. Where this, I'm looking at just a PID. And so that's one of the reasons. And another reason is that you'll see, when you look at malware enough, you'll see that you have malware that calls like itself multiple times or we'll call command prompt a couple of times and so if you hunt on just the the name of the executable it's really difficult to create the timeline of how things happened where if i use pid and process PID or parent pid i can build the timeline linearly saying this parent process spawned this process which and then spawned this process and this process so that's why i chose the pid over the the name of the executable Does that make sense Yeah, um, I only have one IP in here, so, um, but yeah, you could do that as well. But that's why I choose the PID, because I like to go um, back and forth. And one of the reasons why I chose only instead of include is if I do include, it's going to throw the, the field and the value up there, and I want to see everywhere where this executable file is the process, and it's also a parent, right? So I want to see both. That's why I use the only. Any other questions?
Um, no, I have not installed it on like hypervisor and things like that. I installed it on, um, so Sysmod for Linux is kind of crazy. I tried to get it on CentOS 7 and it gave me a big fit. Uh, Ubuntu 18, uh, 2004, it'll work like a champ. Um, and so those are the ones I kind of focused on. And I think Brandon may talk a little bit about it when he gets there, about our, kind of our struggles that we went through. Yep. With what, I'm sorry? Yes, yeah, we did. And which one did you like better, ISP or Core? He'll cover that. Oh. He'll cover that, yeah, yep. I did Sysmon for Linux. I prefer it because I'm good with Sysmon for Windows, and it's like the same, it's the same to me. Like configuring it and managing it's all the same, so. Yeah, yep, and so um, one of the things, so that was, Really, I said, you know, my, I, we, we started out with the question, can we actually find evil? Uh, the second thing is, can I build detections off of it, right? Can I build a playbook play that will alert me on this activity? And so if I go to my alerts interface, what I did was I went ahead, we downloaded all of the uh, Linux Sigma rules that were on uh, Sigma HQ, and I went ahead and acknowledged all these so they weren't distracting y'all. Um, you come down here, you can see I have... Um, four, four playbook plays I wrote. I was able to build plays that look for this, this activity, uh, and I was also able to write a Yara signature that looked for that sliver C2 implant. All right, and so uh, we were able to actually build detections uh, and then modify security on the back end to trigger these alerts. And all of the Yara rules and playbook plays are all on the GitHub, if you all want to use that. All right, anything else about the demo? All right, Brandon's turn. All right, I guess uh, we'll give Brian a chance to breathe here. He's uh, pretty fast and furious uh, when he's given some instruction, lots of practice. Um, so I first wanted to talk about this, this slide here. Get the clicker. Um, it, it's a busy slide, but really the takeaway here is yes, we did, we did um, analyze the data set with all three um, applications and generally they did the same thing, right? So. Brian's question of can we detect it, right? Um, they can all detect it. However, um, we, we, when we ran it with the uh, default rule sets, um, it didn't find much. We had very limited visibility when it came to, uh, sorry, came to detecting uh, the malicious activity with, with just the default rule sets. Uh, so here's a quick little uh, pros and cons for each one. How many in this room are familiar with Laurel or the Laurel project? So Laurel, uh, real quick, is, is essentially it's, a, um, it's an application that rides on top of uh, the Audit D. It's a plugin for Audit D. And so it doesn't require that much additional processing. It just reads the logs, compiles them, translates them, and then outputs it into uh, JSON, so much more easier, uh, much easier to be ingested by your scene. Um, <clears throat> so, like Brian said, Sysmod for Linux, um, you know, the, these are the pros and cons that we found. Um, very uh, a robust data set, um, however, it's still a work in progress. So, um, the developer, I think most of the code was written in about a year ago, and there hasn't been many updates since then. Um, Audit Beats. Audit Beats was really easy to configure. Um, you just install the, the, the beat on the system and run and you're pretty much off into the races. Uh, the downside of Audit Beat is that it doesn't record uh, the, source, the source port of a network connection. So as you guys saw, Bryant was able to quickly pivot between host and network data because of that community ID. We're not going to be able to have that uh, with Audit Beat. Uh, another downside is that um, Audit Beat produces a lot of data. It's, it's really, um, with the default configurations, it's really noisy, produces a lot of data. And with Laurel, um, so the, the benefit of Laurel is if you're already running Audit D, uh, it, it won't interfere with Audit D or any other EDR that you have running. And <clears throat> this is, uh, this makes for more efficient um, processing on the, on the host. Um, the, the con, uh, so it outputs it into kind of its own um, data standard. It's not ECS compliant. 
So when we brought it over to uh, Security Onion, in order to correlate the different events, it took quite a bit of transformation and um, manipulation to make that happen. So um, there's, there's a, the flip side of it being less resource intensive on the host side means you're going to incur more costs on your uh, seam side. All right, so uh, currently, uh, as Bryant mentioned several times, we have uh, all of this is on our GitHubs. Uh, you'll see links at the bottom of the slide. Um, but it basically, all the configuration files and a walkthrough of how to do it are all on the GitHub. Um, so we, we normalized all of the events. We created the Elastic Ingest pipelines and uh, some custom dashboards uh, for each of the data sets. So what's left to be done? Uh, a lot. Um, so all three of these applications have, um, you know, their, their pros and cons, but um, we tested this in a very limited scope, uh, you know, one host for each application. So scaling this, you know, automation, aggregation of all these things um, probably still need to be figured out and tested. And detection opportunities. So uh, to the Linux and Windows question, um, if you go to Sigma HQ's repo right now, there's only 136 Linux detections in that repo, and they're pretty generic. Um, where on the Windows side, we have 1,800. So <clears throat> lots, of, uh, lots of room for improvement for the detections on the Linux side. Uh, yeah, so I guess that, that brings us to, uh, uh, I guess, a, a close. And, and really, the whole point is, uh, whatever application you use, it's not really um, usually it's a case of which one can I use, right? Not which one do I want to use. Um, so there might be some instances where um, your organization is already collecting Audit D for maybe STIG requirements. And so you have to leave Audit D enabled, so maybe, maybe Laurel is the answer. Or, you know, maybe you, you already have Audit B deployed on the network, um, whatever. <clears throat> whatever your case may be. Um, so... Um, there are uh, definitely opportunities. If you go, through, <laughs> if you go uh, to my GitHub page and you look at my code, uh, you might wonder uh, why or, or how. Um, don't judge. It's, uh, I have a very unique coding style. It's uh, brute force and a little bit of plagiarism. So uh, yeah, probably lots, lots of room for, <laughs> to clean up the code and make it more efficient. And then uh, that's all I have. Uh, there's some quick, uh, these are just some quick screenshots of the different values. So because we, we normalized the data, we were able to um, compare the three different data sets and, and kind of the, the output of them. So that's just all these are showing. All right. Uh, so, Brian, do you have anything to add, or we'll open it up if there's any additional questions? Any questions, y'all? Yes, sir. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So the question is, um, you know, instead of me going to Viratrol, could I send it somewhere else? And I could. So you can create custom actions uh, inside of your, your Hunt interface and say, you know, instead of going to Viratrol, I want you to go to this other API. And you could have left clicked on that and then sent it um, there. Now, one thing that Sysmon for uh, Windows does is it will generate the MD5 hash of every executable file that's launched. And that's one thing I wish Sysmon for Linux did. So Windows does that because Sysmon for Linux doesn't generate that hash. You had to figure out um, another way of seeing if it actually launched. You could, yeah. Uh, you could, yeah, because you're, you're the Zeek. I'm not sure if Zeek does the T56 hash. It does SHA-1, yeah. So you could do the, because I, I got it from the Zeek 
file log is Zeek file log does MD5 in SHA-1. Okay. All right. and I, th I think Sarah Cotta does 256. In Stroka? Yep. You, yep, exactly. Because you can do it in Stroka as well. You can hunt from the Stroka logs. All right. That that's a good question. Um, do you want to get it, Brandon? Yeah. So with with uh, to ship the audit D data, we used audit beat for the the audit beat scenario. But then we used file beat when we added um, when we added Laurel onto audit D. We just used a regular file beat. So um, from my understanding, you can't have audit beat and the audit D service running at the same time because audit beats does that for you. So, um, audit beat and file beat. We got one more question. Okay. Somebody over here? I'm sorry. We can talk offline. Was it over here? Um, yeah, it's right there. All right. All right. Uh, yeah, that's it. If, yeah, if you, if you can't if you can't uh, read that or you don't have a copy of the slides, you can just um, uh, get with us after this or or contact us after. Well, uh, the, this talk will be uploaded to YouTube too, so we'll be able to see it there. But it's B Larson eleven oh five and Bryant Dash Treckle. Thanks, guys.